Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? S surviving the afternoon? Everybody still awake? Okay, good, good, that's good. Uh, well, thank you for coming. Um, this is gonna be a, a talk on uh, AI for astrophotography, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, uh, point, small point of interest, uh, this background for this slide uh, actually was suggested by an AI algorithm. I, I typed the title and then I, I said, suggest some backgrounds, and it came up with this. So uh, we're, we're, you're, you're attending an, a, a talk on AI for astrophotography that was constructed partially by AI for astrophotography. <laughs> so um, I, I guarantee, though, that most of the talk was actually not constructed by an AI algorithm. I think we're a few years away from that yet. Uh, maybe at some future AIC, it'll all just be AI algorithms talking to other AI algorithms. We'll see. But here are the, here are the goals of, of what I want to accomplish today. Um, mainly, the main thing I'm trying to do is demystify AI a little bit, give you a peek under the hood, how these algorithms work, how they're constructed, how they're trained, what they can do, what they can't do, what the pros and cons are. So you've got some insight uh, into them when you're using them. Um, that's, that's the real overarching goal here. And we'll dig into a bunch of details on that and uh, talk about specifically how do we use, how do we and how can we use uh, AI for astrophotography in particular, and why do we need it to be specialized toward astrophotography? Why not just general AI? Um, and I'll talk about some processing techniques uh, a little later in the talk. Uh, you know, one of the exciting things about these new tools is that it is opening up new ways of processing images that um, uh, were hard to anticipate, frankly, um, which is pretty cool. And, uh, and then I'll talk about some other applications um, for AI in both amateur and professional uh, astronomy, and, and we'll be able to answer the question, you know, are we as amateur astrophotographers just arriving to uh, the party as, uh, you know, are, are we the first to this party or are we late uh, to this AI party? So I hope you'll find it interesting. Okay, so first of all, what is AI? Uh, it's a, AI is, it's a term that gets bandied about quite a bit. It's got great marketing value. It's catchy, it's intriguing. Um, but, but what is it really, and, and let's, we'll just cover a little bit of terminology here so we, we have this straight. Artificial intelligence as a term is an overarching term that kind of encompasses the whole field. It can, everything from, you know, learning a, a task, like removing the stars from an image or removing noise or something like that, all the way up to high-level reasoning or, you know, our robot overlords taking over the world. That would, all of that would be uh, uh, considered under the rubric of, of AI. Um, uh, then within that, we have the, uh, the discipline of machine learning, which is more of the, I have a specific task, I wanna learn that task through repetition and practice. Uh, that's, that's what we call machine learning. Deep learning is that, but it's when the algorithms are so complex that the details of how the algorithms work were not come up, there was no human hands you know, t tinkering with the nuts and bolts. It was all come up with through training of this complex algorithm, uh, which by the end of the talk, you'll see how that, you'll see how that works. Um, and then neural networks is an even smaller subset of that. It's a particular implementation of machine learning. There are other ways to accomplish uh, machine and deep learning. Uh, neural networks is just one part of that. These terms though get used somewhat interchangeably in the industry and in the press and stuff like that. So you'll hear them, uh, uh, used sometimes correctly, sometimes incorrectly, but I just kind of wanted to break it down here real simply. This is what these things mean. So let's, we're gonna dive into neural networks. Uh, and specifically, we're gonna dive into a type of neural network that's well suited to image processing called convolutional neural networks. And that term will make complete sense uh, by the end of the talk, I promise. Um, so we're gonna dive into the nuts and bolts here about how these things work. Um, and, uh, this will be, if you've ever Googled what is a neural network or how do neural networks work, this won't be that introduction, which is maybe good, maybe it'll be a unique introduction, but it's gonna be kind of a non-traditional introduction to neural networks because I'm assuming that we have a base of knowledge here in terms of how images are processed, some of the fundamentals of how image processing works. And that's a good jumping off point for understanding these, these algorithms. By the way, if you are interested in learning more, I highly recommend Googling how does a neural network work? Because there's some great YouTube videos and, and things out there that folks have done that will introduce the topic nicely. 
in a more general sense. But we'll start with, with convolutional neural networks. And as the name suggests, they are constructed using some image processing operations that we're all more or less familiar with, convolution uh, being probably the top one. Um, and don't worry if you're not familiar with exactly how convolution works, we'll be diving into that in just a moment. So uh, we'll, we'll cover that. Convolution, multi-scale processing, which is kind of an extension of, of convolution in a sense, um, which we're familiar with that too, wavelet transforms and stuff like that, if you've used some of that in PixInsight or, or other tools, um, multi-scale processing is, is fairly familiar. And then we'll cover very briefly uh, nonlinear operations really simple nonlinear operations, uh, but are an ingredient that are necessary uh, for neural networks. So let's jump right into uh, to convolution. And if you're not familiar, uh, this will be a quick overview. If you are familiar, it'll be a refresher. But let's say on the left here, I've got my image that I want to process in these light blue squares. Those numbers are all the pixel values in my image. And then I have this thing called a kernel that I want to apply to this image through a process called convolution. And the way that's done is I've got a three by three kernel here. It's got nine numbers in it. And we can choose various values for these numbers. And uh, the way we apply that to the image is, is indicated, at least for the first pixel of our output image, it's indicated by this dark blue, blue square. So I select nine pixels in the original image. Don't worry too much about the zeros around the edge. That's what we call padding. Uh, I element by element multiply each of those values by the corresponding value in the kernel. And then I add the result. And that's my output value. That's it. That's all you do. That's one step. The next step is you slide that blue window over one pixel. And you do the same thing. Multiply element by element. Add them up. Come up with a new number. And we do it again. And this is all convolution is. It's this simple. We have a, a particular kernel that we're applying to an image, and we apply it in this sliding window fashion through the image to come up with each output pixel value. Very simple to implement, very, very simple to accelerate on modern hardware. So it gets used a lot. Um, but the main reason it gets used a lot is because there's a lot of useful things you can do with it. One of the most common ones that we're probably all familiar with is a Gaussian blur. If my kernel is this thing, which I've, instead of putting numbers here, I've now put lighter and darker pixels, and I convolve this with the original image, I get a blurred version of that image. This is just a Gaussian blur. Hopefully that image actually looks blurred from your, yeah, okay. Um, so that's a, that's a Gaussian convolution kernel. Here is a sharpening kernel. This is now a three by three kernel. And the red pixel values here are negative values. That's just how they're, this is out of PixInsight. That's how it's shown. Um, this is a sharpening kernel. Same mathematical operation. From the computer's perspective, doing the, the, the horsepower of this, it's just multiplying numbers together and adding the result. It's the same, it's just a different kernel values have given me a different result on my image. In this case, I made it sharper. I could do a high pass filter kernel. Same mathematical operation, different kernel value. And I get an output image that passes the high frequency or the small scale components of the image and rejects all the low frequency, you know, variations. We have edge detection kernels. If I pick some different kernel values, then they tend to be good at selecting the right hand edges of things, features in the image. I could rotate that a bit and make that a diagonal edge detection kernel. So these are all convolution operations with different kernels. And as you might imagine, there's many possible convolution kernels. Uh, these are just a few common ones. So that's, that's convolution in a nutshell. And that's one of the ingredients of, of what we'll need to build a neural network. Uh, the next one is multi-scale processing. And let me introduce this this way. If I start with my original image down here and I apply a convolution kernel and I make a blurred version of it and then I subtract that from the original image, then I get this result. And as you might expect, uh, you know, a blurring convolution is a, what we would think of as a low pass filter. It's going to pass the lower spatial frequencies or the 
coarser variations in an image and reject the higher frequency, you know, the small scale variations. So if I subtract that from the original, then I'm going to get this high pass version. I'm going to get all those details in that result. Now one trick here, if you choose this blurring kernel correctly, I can safely take this blurred image and downsample it. So I can do an integer resample and cut down the resolution by half in each dimension and come up with an image that's one quarter the number of pixels. So now I've just down, done a downsample. And I haven't lost any information in doing this process. If I took this image, uh, is my pointer working here? Yeah. If I took this image and I upscale it by a factor of two, I get back to this blurred version, and then I add back in this high frequency version, I get back to the exact same thing. So I, I've just created a different representation of the same data. I've, I've decomposed it into low frequency components and high frequency components. I can repeat that process. I've just redrawn that, that previous slide. I've just redrawn it in a different way here. Original image here equals the sum of the blurred image and the high frequency, the high pass filtered version, and then I can downsample that. This would be the first layer of this operation that I'm doing. I can repeat that. I can take this blurred image and blur it again and take the difference and create another high pass filtered image like this and then downsample that. That's my second layer. And I can repeat that and I can repeat it again and I can repeat it again. And I could keep going if I want to, but I'll stop at five layers. You get the point. Um, but the, the larger point is I've still not lost any information. I've decomposed my image into a bunch of components. That last blurred version, very blurred version, plus the last high pass filtered version, up sampled by a factor of two, added to the next layer up, the high, the high pass uh, component from that, up sampled, added to, you get the point, we keep going all the way to the top layer of uh, high pass information, we get back the exact same original image. And in case you were wondering what a wavelet transform was, that's a wavelet transform, we just did one. That's all a wavelet transform really is. There's different blurring functions for different wavelet transforms and whatnot, but that's the basic operation. Uh, and that is one more ingredient that we need to build a neural network. So we have convolution, we've got multi-scale processing, could or could not be wavelets. You can, if you're doing wavelets, you're being rigorous about not losing information when you downsample. Um, neural networks don't necessarily do that, but it's a very similar math operation. Okay, what's the other ingredient then that we need? That's the nonlinear operation, and I'm going to just use a probably one of the simplest nonlinear operations we could possibly do, and that is a, thre a thresholding operation. So let's take one of those detail high pass filter images that I had earlier, and let's pick a pixel value and subtract that from the image. Anything that goes negative, we set to zero. Anything that didn't go negative, we leave alone. So we've just subtracted a, a platform or a bias or a pedestal, if you will, from our image, and we get some result. And we can already see that maybe these two operations, the high pass filter and the thresholding, might be useful for building a star detector. As you can see, the stars tend to be the highest frequency components in an image. Um, and it's this one operation here has done a reasonable job of selecting just the stars. I say reasonable because there is some uh, elements of the uh, spiral arm of the galaxy uh, caught in there too. So we have to be tricky about adjusting these thresholds, but could be useful. So those are, I will claim, the, th the three and only three ingredients we need to actually build the neural network that's going to do this job. Um, but before we dive into how we actually construct that network, let's just think through, like, if we had just those tools, how would we build that algorithm manually? We've got simple arithmetic, pixel math, we've got convolution, multi-scale processing, thresholding, and let's say we can use each tool as many times as we need and in any order. How would we go about building an algorithm that detects or removes stars? Well, let's walk through it. We might start with, let's do some rigorous mathematical analysis on the problem we're trying to solve. Stars have, are well modeled by Gaussian or Moffat profiles, let's say. Okay, good, that might tell us something about the spatial frequency content of an image with stars in it, and maybe something about where we would set thresholds to detect them. 
Good. We'll do some, do some good solid uh, thinking and engineering there, thinking about those things. In terms of the actual image processing, well, we've seen multi-scale processing looks pretty interesting. Let's start with that. Let's decompose our image into all these layers. Earlier layers see the finer scale features. Later layers see the coarser features. The early ones will see the small stars. The later ones see the big stars, something like that. Seems like it could be useful. Let's do that. Maybe we'll then, to those results, we'll apply some thresholding. Figure out, okay, how do I just select the stars out of each of those layers? It'll be tricky to get that right. Was the image taken on a refractor or a reflector? It might change the range of sizes that I see and the thresholds I need. Uh, maybe we make, because we're still picking up some elements of the galaxy spiral arms, maybe we'll make some handcrafted convolution kernels. You know, I showed a small subset of all possible convolution kernels. You can make curved ones that picked up curved edges and straighter ones that maybe pick up the diffraction spikes on stars, stuff like that. You could imagine handcrafting some convolution kernels that would select for different commonly seen shapes that we're interested in. So let's say we do that, and then we somehow combine all those results from all the different layers that we're processing into some overall star mask. And, okay, now we gotta make it work on all images, not just the one that we were testing the algorithm on. Uh, it's gotta work on images from camera lenses to small refractors to big reflectors. So, okay, let's add some more parameters that we can fine tune and adjust so it makes it work on all images. And um, uh, if we don't, on, on some of those parameters, we won't quite know how to adjust them, so we'll make those, we'll make the user adjust those. Uh, put, the, put in a slider that has some cryptic uh, description on how to use it. Um, uh, hopefully, we, ultimately, we wrap this in some user interface that is comprehensible and intuitive. Um, uh, but this is, if you were to build a manual star detector, this is basically the process you would follow. This is kind of the pattern that has been followed for image processing algorithm development for decades and it's been extremely workable. But it has its limits, it's, and the limit is how complex can those algorithms get? And it comes down to how many parameters do you need to adjust to get it to behave right in all circumstances? So it's, it's difficult. So it, let's, that's how we would do it manually. It's, it quickly becomes intractable, especially for a problem like this. You might get it to work on round stars, but then what about stars with diffraction spikes and stuff like that? All right, so how do we do this is it with a neural network? Well, we know convolution can be useful. We think we're gonna use that. Multi-scale processing, yeah, probably gonna use that. Uh, see, see features on different scales. Simple nonlinear operation like thresholding should be good. Let's, let's build a network that has these operations in it. Doesn't necessarily know how to remove stars yet, but it has the fundamental, it can do the operations needed. Here's what one layer of that network might look like. I have my original image here, and I'm gonna apply some convolution kernels to it. I've got three here, it's different ones. There's a, there's a high pass filter here, there's an edge detector, horizontal edge detector here, there's a diagonal edge detector here. And then I'll run it through the thresholding, and it'll produce some output images. And then I'll downsample those by two. Great, that's a, that's a layer of the network. We wouldn't, by the way, just stop at three kernels. We'd probably have 16 or 32 or 64 different kernels, pick a number. Uh, and also, crucially, all of those values, the values of the kernels in the kernel boxes themselves and the values of the thresholds that come after them are learned parameters. Those are not parameters that the developer determines. We don't handcraft any, any kernels. In fact, it's better if the developer keeps their grubby mitts off of these parameters and lets the training process uh, do its work to train them. So this is one layer of the network. I've, I've done some stuff to my image with convolution. I've applied some nonlinear thresholding. I've downsampled. That would be one layer, and we're gonna build many layers of this, and I'll need a different way to draw that. And it kind of looks like this. So I start with my original image here on the left. Each of these blue wafers here, I guess, each of these blue sections would be one convolution kernel and it's gonna produce a result. I can do the convolution, I run it through a threshold, I produce an output image. And then I downsample and I go into my next layer where I do a bunch of convolutions, I do my thresholding and I downsample. And I go into my next layer and I do a bunch of convolutions, et cetera, all the way down to this inner layer, uh, which is the, the most downsampled uh, version. 
And then, okay, I've, I've done all this. Now I have to get back to something that's my original image size. So that I can like, those are gonna be the stars and I'll subtract that from my original image, something like that. So let's upsample by a factor of two using some simple interpolation technique. Run it through a bunch of convolution kernels again and the nonlinear thresholding operation and then we'll do it again. Upsample, convolve, threshold, upsample, convolve, threshold. And now I'm back to my original image size and hopefully once all is said and done, this thing will know that output image will be just the stars or equivalently just the original image without the stars. All right, so that, that is, by the way, that's really what the neural network looks like. And it looks like that for star exterminator, it looks like that for noise exterminator, it looks like that for star net, plus plus and V2, and it looks like that for topaz denoise. Uh, they all use the same basic structure because it, it actually works pretty well. But okay, so we've built a network and I said we didn't pick any of the parameter values. In fact, we start off the network with random numbers in those parameters. All the kernels, all the thresholds, random numbers. So, and it has all told, it has millions of parameters to adjust. In the case of Star Exterminator, it's 21 million individual parameters to tune. Starnet plus plus had 54 million, Starnet V2 has 30 million, Noise Exterminator has 24 million, Topaz Denoise has 14 million. All have to be individually adjusted, all have to be tuned to do a specific task. So how are we gonna do that? How are we gonna adjust 21 million different numbers? Uh, well, this is what neural network training is all about. And to accomplish that, we need two more things. One is a training data set. And the other one is something we call a loss function. And the training data set is actually uh, pretty intuitively easy to understand. I have this network, and you have to think of a neural network as a new, newborn infant. It doesn't know how to do anything yet. It can wiggle. And you have to give it a goal. And then you have to let it learn that goal. And the way we give it a goal is with the training data. And in this case, I give it the original image, that's gonna be the input to the network. It's going to compute something, what it thinks should be the output, and I need to give it a target. So this is what it should produce. So here's one training data set pair, the original image and the starless image. And if I come up with a number of such pairs, maybe taken through different instruments, uh, different colors, different scales, some of them through narrow band, et cetera, so it has a good, kind of a range of examples of, of real, real tasks it needs to solve. That's its training data. So that's, that's one ingredient. And then the next one is the loss function. Now a loss function, it's a fancy name for a score. How badly did the network do at the task that, that we've assigned it? And uh, it's just a math function. It's a formula that comes up with a single number that says how badly did the network do? Not how good it did, but how bad it did. And we do that because we always want to make the loss function go lower in value, which means it's getting better. Um, simple example of a commonly used loss function is what we call mean absolute error. Really easy to understand. You take the output of the network, you subtract the target image, which you wanted it to produce, and then you take the, that's all the, think of those as the, the error values in each pixel. Take the absolute value of those because we don't care whether the errors are positive or negative, they're still errors. And then take the average value of that. That's a super simple and very widely used and very successful uh, loss function for training a neural network. So, okay, we have a neural network. It does a bunch of computations on an image, it spits out another image. We have a way to score it. Now what? How do we actually use that information to go back and update all these parameters, these 21 million parameters in the network? There's a trick of calculus called the chain rule, if anybody remembers that from, from uh, calculus, where you can compute how every individual parameter in the network, all 21 million of them, how a small change in one of those parameters would affect the value of the loss function. And it's called the partial derivative, and it's pretty easy to Figure that out back to, from the loss function back to any parameter back in the network, you can figure out what the slope is. If I were to change this parameter a little bit, how does the loss function change? What's that slope? And technically what we're doing is we're getting the gradient 
of the loss function to that parameter or the partial derivative. And then we can use a cool trick called gradient descent, which is an optimization, a numerical optimiza optimization algorithm. If we know the slope at any point, we just go downhill. If you're trying to find the bottom of a ravine and you're standing up on the side of the side of it somewhere, you're going to pour some water and watch which way the water goes and you're going to go that way. And that's pretty much how gradient descent works. Uh, this is a real simple depiction of a potential loss function where we've got two parameters, x and y, and z is the value of our loss function. So it creates this surface in 3D space. And let's say we start up here at a corner of it. We can compute the slope using that chain rule and then just go downhill. And we do that in small steps because we don't want to overshoot the bottom. So we'll do it, you know, take baby steps on the way down there and eventually work our way down to uh, the bottom of it. And this is, this is how we train a neural network. Now, the loss functions are never this simple. I wish they were. Uh, Star Exterminator would have trained in five minutes instead of two weeks uh, if it was that simple. Loss functions usually look more like this. They're a little crazy, and they've got lots of what we call local minima, so little dips where you could imagine some numerical optimization algorithm gets to the bottom of one of those and says, I'm done. The slope here is zero. I'm, I'm home. But actually, there's a, there's a much deeper uh, minimum, a much lower value of the loss function, a much better result uh, a short distance away. So the way uh, training a neural network works is it's fairly straightforward. Put all that together. We take an Im input and target image pair. We run the input image through the network. It gives us a result. We compute the value of the loss function. And we compute the gradients to all 21 million parameters. Uh, in the network. Simple, right? This is straightforward. Um, and then we take a small step in a direction that we hope lowers the loss function. And then we repeat that on every training uh, image pair that we've got. And then we do that uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of time, at which point my GPU says, gives me this emoji. Uh, and uh, hopefully it, it, it finishes. So that was, there's, there was, that was a somewhat graphical, but a lot of, you know, me ha waving my hands and, and some non-rigorous mathematical explanation. But what I really wanted to show you to give it even intuitive feel for how this works is show you a neural network doing this. So this is from uh, an early version of Star Exterminator. I had the training routine save off a frame, a prediction as we call it, on this image of the Trifid Nebula as it trained. Starting from ground zero, it, all the numbers were just random numbers, to you'll see it start to learn. It starts kind of slow at first, uh, but you'll see it start to, start to learn its, its task. It's kind of cool. There's the end result, and there's the original, and there's the starless version. What I, what I find, uh, and that, that, by the way, took two weeks on two high-end GPUs running in parallel. And uh, I, I keep the computer that does that, uh, I call it Gargantua, uh, and I keep it in my pantry, much to my wife's chagrin. Um, we can't keep chocolate in the pantry, because it, it, it all just melts. So, uh, but, but what I find interesting in this is, um, you know, initially it, it doesn't do much and then it has a pretty easy time figuring out how to replace the stars with black holes. So it, it figures out what a star is pretty quickly. What takes it a lot of time is to figure out what to do, what to put in its place. And that's actually, if you think about that, that's the harder part, even if you're editing it by hand. That's the harder part. What do you put where the star was? And uh, the neural network has just as much trouble learning that as, as uh, we would. But uh, that's what it looks like to train one. 
Um, and really, it's, it's an interesting, you know, developing uh, neural networks for image processing is, is very different from traditional algorithm development, as you, as you kind of saw earlier with, like, how would we build this manually exercise. In the traditional approach, you know, we identify our goal, and then we do some hardcore engineering and mathematical analysis on how we might solve that signal versus noise, pixel statistics, frequency spectra, et cetera. And then we try to hand design mathematical operations that are gonna accomplish that task. Any parameters in there that are, need to be adjusted are all hand adjusted. In contrast, neural network development is, okay, yeah, we still identify our goal, but then we come up with our loss function, our means of measuring how well it's achieving that goal. We spend a bunch of time developing our training data set. That's actually one of the key parts and uh, one of the most important parts. And we come up with some neural network that, you know, it, it, sometimes it doesn't even really matter too much about the details of the structure of that network. You just give it enough capacity to learn and then you train it. And it's, as a developer, it's a little bit liberating because you get to focus on like, okay, what, what am I trying to get this thing to do? How do I measure how well it's doing? And then I don't worry about the nuts and bolts. You let the network train. You can actually keep your hands off the network and let it learn. Um, so the developer focuses on posing the problem, evaluating the result, and then coaxing the network to train. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, all those, all those 21 million parameters those are all learned. None of those are hand adjusted. There's not one hand adjusted parameter in there. How do you ensure convergence you know, <laughs> in, in 21 million parameter space? Yeah, you, you really don't. That's kind of what I mean by coaxing a network to train. Uh -huh. you, you try to train it for a while and you see if it's converging. If it's not, you go do something. A lot of times it comes down to, to taking smaller steps. Uh -huh. If you take too large, if you imagine it has, you have a really deep valley and you see the slope is this away, you could easily just jump across that valley and then maybe on the next iteration jump completely out of it. So slowing down the learning rate and taking smaller steps is, that's the, usually the most powerful knob we turn. But couldn't you get caught in a local Yep, absolutely. Sometimes then you need to increase the learning rate to make sure you bounce out of it. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of games played there to, to coax it to train. Okay, so that's, I mean, that's kind of, Neural networks for image processing in a nutshell. That's, that's, they're really, there's not much more to them than that. Um, so hopefully that, that demystifies it a little bit. Um, and, and, and by the way, I mentioned, I mentioned the, the, the three different solutions I mentioned, star removal and noise reduction and, and noise reduction, Topaz. Um, they all use the same neural network structure. They all have a comparable number of parameters, you know, tens of millions. Um, the big difference is the training data, the training methodology. That's, and, and how you're writing that loss function, how you're scoring it. How are you, you know, teaching the network what it should and should not do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's hard. That's hard. Yeah, so for star removal, it's hand editing. There's no other, there's no other, because there's no, there's no solution for removing stars. So you've got to, you got to do it the traditional way, hand edit for hours and hours and hours, and hope you get that right. Because if you do something systematically wrong in how you create that training data, the network will faithfully learn all of your mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, the training data is where you end up spending, uh, probably spend up more time on creating the training data set than you do on actually coding up the network and the training loop. Yeah, noise reduction, it's a little bit easier to create the training data set because you can just take a noiseless image if you can get your hands on one of those and add noise to it and then teach the network to remove it. Efficiency? Oh, like how fast it does its operation? Oh, in, term of the, in terms of the training process. Yeah, that, um, that sometimes just takes a really long time. So that, that run that you just saw for Star Exterminator was a two-week run on two high-end GPUs. Noise Exterminator took two months running on that same hardware to begin to show some progress. But, but are you certain that the, the end result is the most efficient process to get 
oh, in terms of the network architecture itself? No, absolutely not. No. There's a, there's a thing you can do called an ablation study, fancy name. You start removing stuff from the network to see what is it really, does it really need 21 million parameters or could it get by with 15 or 10? You could start uh, scaling down the network or removing layers and stuff like that and then see if it can come up with a comparable result. Um, but that's, each one of those is you're training a new network from scratch. So uh, generally what's done is you get something that's good enough and it seems to be working well and move on, move on. yeah. Yeah, 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 pretty much. Yeah. So, in the Star Exterminator Pixinsight, I know that when that comes up, there's a, a way to, to download like new version. Yeah. So, what is actually in each version? You're actually downloading the neural network. So, the, the plugin itself, the software that actually you know, presents a window and allows you to select linear or not and you know, click, you know, click go, um, that's like less than one megabyte of code. That's in the initial install. The neural network itself is more like an 85 megabyte download because that's all 21 million. So these are 21 million floating point numbers that it's downloading. And it also contains the information about how they're all connected. So that's, the, that's what you're downloading is the actual neural network. Is each version then a, a, uh, uh, an improved version of the existing neural network? Hopefully. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> That's the idea. Uh, okay, cool. So, um, as you can see, it's a very different approach. Uh, and and um, let's let's look at some. Did I, I didn't go through these yet. Pros and cons, right? Okay, pros and cons. Pros of of using an AI solution for this stuff is we can come up with these fantastically complex algorithms. You know, twenty one. It's a it's a big math equation with twenty one million adjustable parameters way more complex than we could come up with by hand. Um, and I, I hope, there's one other detail here, just in passing, I hope that at this point, although we call this AI, there's not really any intelligence here. It's a big math equation. There's really nothing too mysterious about it other than there's 21 million numbers and they all combine in some complex way. So, um, that, that was one thing that kind of hit me because I, I didn't know anything about AI a year and a half ago. And I started diving into this, into this field. And it was kind of about the time I did that video that I realized, wait a minute, these things aren't intelligent. There's no, there's no intelligence here. Uh, it's just a big math equation. It's, it's learning to do a task and it's, it's doing a fantastic job at it, but it's not, it doesn't know what it's doing. It can't decide, I think I'll do star removal a different way. You know, that's all up to whoever's coding it up. Um, uh, another pro from a development standpoint is, you know, the developer gets to focus on the goal instead of the, the detailed implementation. Uh, that's kind of liberating, as I mentioned. Um, and it, it takes advantage of widely available uh, hardware, which is relatively affordable now, the uh, GPUs, <laughs> depending on which GPU you want to get. Um, and there's, a, there's software platforms available for doing this development. The, probably the most prominent one being TensorFlow uh, from Google, which is a it's really a software platform that frees the developer up from having to implement the details of how the network is parallelized on GPU hardware and stuff like that. It figures all that out. You get to focus on what's my network architecture look like. On the con side, and there are some important ones, um, well, I mentioned on the pros, the number one pro is that we can create these fantastically complex <laughs> algorithms. The number one con is these algorithms are fantastically complex. Um, there, is, there is a serious observability problem with neural networks. If you want to understand, you know, why did version 7 of Star Exterminator remove this star and not that star? And you want to trace that back to what parameters in the network were responsible for that effect. It's not really tractable to do that. You might be able to trace that back for one particular case. But if you wanted to go so far as like, oh, okay, it's those parameters there. Let's adjust those. You'll break it you'll break it. You might fix that one thing in that one case, but you'll break 10 other things. Um, so it's really just not possible to hand tune these things. You really just have to retrain them. And uh, it, mostly that comes down to adding to the data set, the training data set, or improving the quality of the training data set. If I made some systematic error in how I removed stars, oops, I gotta go do better on that and, and make the training set better. Um, 
And the other big con that I want to mention in this group is that it very possible running an AI algorithm on your data for it to destroy the scientific value of that data. In fact, I almost guarantee it. Um, there's no, you know, the algorithms that have been trained so far have no, uh, they don't get scored on how well they conserve flux, for example. So if you wanted to do photometry on an image that's been through one of these algorithms, it's going to be wrong, almost guaranteed. Uh, similarly with star centroids, they're going to move. Uh, so if you're doing, if you're using your data for scientific purposes, I wouldn't run AI algorithms on them unless they were specifically trained to conserve star flux or conserve, conserve the positions of star centroids. Um, and uh, yeah, just use traditional methods if you're doing, if you're doing science. All right, so a couple of processing techniques. That was neural networks, pros and cons thereof. Let me do just a touch on a couple of processing techniques that are using these new tools. And this first one is in processing comments. And this one is due to Adam. Uh, Adam's here, right? Yeah, Adam came up with this, I believe. Um, how to process comet images so you don't have star residuals. So as we know, when we shoot a comet, the, uh, the comet moves. Now, this is Neowise from uh, uh, a while back. And if we you know, okay, we want a sharp image of the comet, so we're going to register those at same images on the comet, and now the stars move. So, okay, we'll try to integrate those and hope that our pixel rejection algorithm works well and doesn't give us something like this, but it always does. We end up with a, yeah, the image of the comet is sharp, but we've got star residuals in there. Uh, so, okay, what do we do? Well, let's remove the stars before we integrate those, run star exterminator or star net, and get rid of the stars before we integrate. And now, when we integrate that, we end up with a very clean image of the comet uh, and no star residuals, so great. But, hey, I want the stars in my image too, so let's take the set of images that was registered on the stars and generate the stars only versions of those images and integrate those. And now I've got the stars only and I can just pixel math those back in and I've got my sharp stars and my sharp comet. And uh, I thought that was pretty, this, this is, I, I was really pleased when Adam uh, uh, messaged me about this because I, I didn't anticipate this use of this tool. This is pretty cool. All right, another technique, um, separate uh, detail adjustments for the stellar portion of the image and the non-stellar portion of the image. As I'm sure everyone knows, you know, the, the non-stellar portions of your data can generally take a lot more sharpening by whatever method, deconvolution, unsharp mask, what have you, wavelets. Uh, if, you, if you process the entire image using the values that you'd want to use for all the non-stellar parts of your image, you get dark halos around your stars or oversaturated stars, etc. So using these new tools, you can separate those out. Uh, so what we do is we separate out the stars from the image, pick your, pick your tool, and then let's reduce the noise. And let's sharpen the detail in both images. Pick your tool, I'll use noise, noise exterminator here, but you could use whatever your favorite noise reduction method is and whatever your favorite detail enhancement method is. In this case, I've picked different settings for the detail parameter in each image. So I'm, in both, I'm re removing 90% of the noise. On the detail parameter, I'm being much more aggressive uh, on the starless image than I am on the stars. And I'm, you know, for sure, I'm probably being a little over aggressive with this, but I'm trying to make the point in these, uh, this processing technique. Um, but I separate those out, I run different parameters on them, and then I recombine with pixel math, and I have the recombined version here, and then here's the original uh, for comparison. So I've got not, lots of nice detail in the galaxy, but I haven't, I don't have dark halos around my stars. So just a simple example. I, I'm looking forward to what you all come up with in terms of new techniques that these new tools uh, enable. I think it's going to be a fun, uh, a fun few years. Um, so, uh, so that's it on the, on the processing techniques. I wanted to touch on a little bit also what other applications AI is finding uh, in both amateur and professional astronomy. One of the 
really cool one I came across on cloudy nights and then realized that they're here at the conference is this uh, wavefront sensing using AI. So here, instead of, instead of building a neural network that can take one image and then output another image, it's taking an image and outputting a set of numbers, which would be your wavefront aberration uh, coefficients or, or what have you for your optics. And I thought this was really cool. You don't need the $100,000 interferometer to test your primary and secondary mirrors. You can take an out-of-focus star image, run it through this algorithm, and, uh, and see how good it is. I haven't used this, but I just think it's a really cool application of AI to a problem. Um, and early on, I, I kind of posed the question, you know, are, we, are we the first ones to this party? Are we the ones getting this party started with AI, or are we late to the party? Uh, and the answer is we're late. We're actually very late. Um, the, pros have been, the pros are way ahead of us. Uh, these black hole images that you saw uh, recently, uh, first of M87 and then more recently, very recently of uh, our own Milky Way, these images were constructed from the radio telescope data using an AI algorithm. Now, I said what I said earlier about using AI for science. You have to be careful about that. Uh, I'm sure they were, but these algorithms were trained for this purpose. And it, this wasn't a neural network. It was a different uh, algorithm, but it was still a machine learning algorithm. It was still trained. Uh, so pretty cool. They were able to, and it was the amount of data. I mean, you saw the pictures of the big stacks of hard drives that they had to ship all the data around on, right? It's pretty amazing. They condensed that all down to a single image. And in a similar vein, I found a paper where a group has come up with a machine learning algorithm to take an image of a black hole shadow like that and give the parameters of what viewing angle are we seeing this from? Because, you know, like the image of the accretion disk does weird things as it gets lensed around the black hole, right? So how do we translate what we see in one of these images to what's our viewing angle? What's the mass of the black hole? What's the spin of the black hole? These guys have come up with an AI algorithm that uh, that does this. And it's an interesting problem because what's the training data set for this? <laughs> we have this many images of black holes. Uh, the way they did it, and this is a, a technique that's commonly used in, in machine learning, is you come up with a synthetic data set. You come up with a mathematical model that will generate images of black holes at various viewing angles and masses and spins and stuff like that. And then you use that as the input to the neural network and you train it to recognize those. Are those right? That's an open question, but that's how the training is done. I think they would double check these results against other more traditional methods for a while. Here's another solution uh, that classifies. So that's a whole other task in, that neural networks are really good at is classifying images, or what, in this case, what we call segmenting images. For every pixel in the input image, I wanna identify what type of object is that? Is it a galaxy? Is it a spiral galaxy? Is it an elliptical galaxy? Is it a star? Is it a nebula? And so you can build a neural network that will go through and classify these. This same type of neural network, by the way, is used in uh, uh, driving automation. The car's camera takes a picture of the road. You want to classify every pixel in that road. Is it a crosswalk? Is it another car? Is it a pedestrian? You want to color every one of those pixels depending on what type of object that is. And uh, this, I thought this was a great example too. So the image on the left is the input to the neural network. And can you spot the planets? I can't, but their neural network can. They've figured out how to take this and identify the planets using a, using a neural network. It's pretty cool. So, so yeah, we're late to the party. We've got, what, two tools now really? Two types of tools now, noise reduction and um, uh, star removal. And uh, we'll see what the future holds. I think it'll be, I think it'll be exciting. So that's what I've got. Thanks for listening, and uh, I'd be happy to take some uh, some questions. Oh, believe me, I've tried to get that two weeks down. <laughs> it's, it's a smaller number. Yeah, there are various optimization algorithms that that developing those and making them work faster is. That's like a whole branch of mathematics. Yeah. And that's not something that I'm, I'm expert in. I use what 
is available, and then I tweak the parameters on that to try to get it to run faster. Yeah, the one, uh, the one that we use is uh, called simultaneous perturbations, stochastic approximation. Okay. And it's a well known, it's a well known algorithm. Just Google it. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's fast. Yeah. I use Atom, Adam? the Atom optimizer. Yeah. That's very commonly used in neural nets. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sure it is. There is. I thought about including some of that material in the in the presentation, but um, I couldn't because of uh, for the sake of time. But there are. You can study how the neural network works. You can give it an input image, and you can go look at what are those intermediate images at each layer of the network. And there's. Uh, I haven't done that for for star exterminator or noise exterminator, but there's a really cool study that Google did on a facial recognition network, and. You'll see, you can see that the first layer starts selecting edges or maybe like little curves, parts of noses, stuff like that. And then later net parts of the network are selecting eyes. You'll see an image of an eye or an image of a nose. Like it's constructed convolution kernels that will select nose-shaped things. I mean, how cool is that? That's like, it's really cool. Um, but yeah, and, and, and the further and further down you go in the network, the more abstract the features, you'll start recognizing whole faces. Uh, and stuff like that. It's really pretty cool how, and there's no way you could construct those convolution kernels by hand with any degree of success. It's, it's a pretty new, pretty cool field. Yeah. You said like when you have 21 million uh, parameters, how many variables is that? 21 million. Yeah, they're all they're all adjustable. Yeah. And how do you decide the resolution of each one? Of that is a uh, yeah. There's <laughs> it's, I have a slide for that. It's funny. Um, there are kind of two camps in like, okay, like how many convolution kernels do I give it at each layer? And should those be three by three convolutions or four by four or et cetera? And there's, if you look at the research papers in this area, the explanations fall into two categories. One of them is the thing on the left, the rigorous, rigorous mathematical proof of why it is the way it is and why it's, that's the best solution. And the other one, and I kid you not, this is a quote out of a research paper <laughs> so, you know, whatever works. And you keep, sometimes, there, there are, it's really kind of a marriage between the rigorous mathematical approach. Like, there's good solid reasoning that goes into why this architecture is the way it is. We talked about some of that. Like, multi-scale processing has a good chance of being able to see things at different feature scales. And then it's a lot of tweaking and trial and error. So, so kind of going back to the 21 million, how did you determine there, that, that was not a, that's how it came out. So I constructed a network that had, I thought, the right number of layers and the right number of convolution kernels per layer, and the number came out to be 21 million. That's, that's that, it. That, that was what I yeah, again. yeah, yeah. The, the 21 million was the cart, not the horse. Yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. Do I need training data sets? Yeah. If you find an image on which star exterminator or noise exterminator is not doing well, then absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that's really, that's, that's when you want to add to the training data set, that's your motivation for doing that, is there's a case that it didn't cover well. And so you want to extend it and train it to be a little better. But yeah, the, the, my email's always open, as, as they say, uh, for uh, data, if, it's, if you find a case where it's not working well. Yeah, yeah. oh, and, and thank you for, uh, there's been a number of folks that have already submitted images like that, and they're now part of the training data set, so thank you, anybody who's done that. So are there other um, routines, uh, processes, groups that are on the drawing board for this insight using the neural net? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> stay, stay tuned, watch this space. Uh, yeah. yeah, sharpening is, an, is kind of an obvious choice, I think, some form of sharpening. In the back there. Yeah, it seems like the, the loss function in terms of the cleverness and the quality of the loss function is between your approach and someone else's. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, yeah, the loss function, and that can even go on to, there's, there's really cool ways to train networks uh, where it's not so much a loss function, but it's actually you create two different neural networks 
one of which is trying to generate the result you want, and the other one is trying to spot that result as fake. And they call it a generative adversarial network. It's two networks competing. And uh, that's kind of a glorified loss function in a, in a sense. But yeah, that's the, 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 the actual loss functions and the engineering that goes into them and the training methods are, are very much, like you won't see people giving those things away because that's part of the crown jewels. That and the training data. Yeah. The neural network architecture itself is somewhat secondary. The training data and the loss function are much more important. Yeah, they're, they're, some of them were doing things that you would find obvious, like detecting for horizontal lines or straight lines uh, for diffraction spikes, for example, or curved edges that are saturated, you know, with some threshold. Yeah, some of them end up being obvious like that. Other ones are like, I don't know what that's doing. And um, uh, there may be, you know, there's, it's 21 million parameters. It's an open question whether it, it really needs that many. There may be a junk DNA in a sense, in those parameters. But it's really hard to tell because when you do what you're proposing where you say, okay, let's run an image through it and see which what the convolution kernels do, you're only looking at one image. And there's a bunch of other images in the training data set. So you, you're only looking at one case. And some of that junk DNA may be important in other cases. Yeah. So how many layers are you using? Um, that, it's about 21 for Star Exterminator, yeah. Yeah, down sample, down sample, down sample, and then, and then back up the other side. Yeah. 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 Yes. I, my, my hope is to continue training, and really that a lot of that has to do... That particular problem is really hard. And if you think about doing that by hand, that's the same difficulty that the neural network has. It's just as hard for it to figure out what to do with that situation as it is for you. You know, a big, a big star that takes up a good section of a tile that it's processing, it's like, what, how do you fill in those pixel values? Um, the hope is to get that better and better and better. It'll probably always be true that there's going to be some case that it never quite fully handles. You'll need to do a little bit of touch up. Uh, but the hope is to make that better and better. All right, well, thanks, everybody, for coming. And um, I really appreciate the, the, the time. And I'm available afterwards if you have any other, any other questions.